a conversation I've been looking forward to uh, because the money trap by Alok Sama is uh, easily the most engaging book I have read recently. And uh, what I find tough to wrap my head around uh, is that this book comes from a veteran uh, on the high streets of global finance. And uh, to use a metaphor like uh, Alok does, um, he's a neurosurgeon. Uh, in finance, uh, in his domain. And there are a few reasons. Let me give you a few reasons why I like this book. Um, so it's given me a ringside view of how venture capital operates and think investment banking, actually. Uh, I got a better understanding of what transpires at Silicon Valley and how big tech goes about business. Uh, there's SoftBank that I viewed from a distance. And uh, I've always wondered, what is this mysterious entity about? Uh, though I've had friends there. Uh, but Alok has taken me so much more closer to the action. I got a ringside view. Uh, there's a reading list that emerges from the pages of uh, Money Trap. And they make for some incredible recommendations. And I wonder how does Alok read as much as he does. Uh, maybe he'll have some pointers to offer us. And uh, finally, uh, like I was just telling Alok a few minutes ago, all of this is, is he's pulled it off without um, sounding intimidating. In fact, um, I'm working off the assumption that Alok is a friend whom I've known for a few years now uh, because his writing has that quality about it. And uh, But there's a line that uh, has stayed uh, from the book uh, with me that everyone is, a, well, you know, an idiot. Uh, for Alok, unless <laughs> I have another wife. Now, I cannot use it to Alok Hindi uh, because this is being recorded. So, Alok, I don't know what it takes to prove to you that uh, I am not one because your mind is already made up about me. So, hopefully, <laughs> by the end of this conversation, maybe I may, you know, get, get you to change. That, you, know. you know, you know, you know, Charles. The not to resort to as writers, we we try not to use cliches, but 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 there is a cliche that comes to mind, which is flattery will get you everywhere. So, so with the with the with the introduction you gave me, you 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 have formally stuck on off the off the list. <laughs> of the list of, if you know what yeah, I mean, yeah, of the list you, of, you you've you know, qualified. You've qualified. As, 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 qualified. As, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no, no. Alok, I've got one heck of a lot of questions for you. So we'll 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 play it by ear, and then I don't know about time. No, no, no. Far away, far away. I I have as much time as you need, and I look forward to the discussion. So, oh, uh, so Alok, so so you you've opened with uh, something very interesting. You know, you opened yeah. the book with a comment that made me laugh in the irony of it all, you know, yeah. as, far as, as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a banker uh, that, and how no one has ever said that. And yeah. uh, later on in the next chapter, uh, you go on to talk about how you ought to have walked away from it, but uh, how no one ever walks away. And uh, yeah, yeah. Jerry, as we go on, you know, you were, you were enjoying the ride. And, yeah, yeah, and um, or, or was it the money trap that you were in? You know, so what 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 was the tipping point for you? Um, when did you start enjoying being in the business? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's a good question, uh, and there's a lot to unpack in that question. I see it as a couple of questions. By the way, I tend to ramble a little bit, so if oh, I do, please, please bring me, please, please, bring, please bring me, bring, bring me back, so we, we we don't lose the chain of your questions, which I which I obviously want to respond right. to. So the the money trap is it's a bit of a cliche once again, um, and I tell you the reason I went along with the money trap as a title is it rhymes with the honey trap, and as you know, in the book, there's actually an attempt right. at sexual blackmail. Um, but 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 when I talk about the money trap, this 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 comment that you made about nobody ever walks away, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And a lot of my colleagues, particularly kind of in the those in the later stages of their career, in their 40s and their 50s, tell me that without any explanation, they immediately understood that title uh, because. 
even if you're bored, even if you're stressed out, it's just really, really difficult for people to walk away with lots of money. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, you know, I'm, you know, kind of the monk who give up his Ferrari kind of thing or like, you know, I'm above this all. Uh, I, I, a part of what I've tried to do in this book, and, and, and I'd like to think that is what appeals to people is be completely honest. And, and I will be completely honest with you. I was completely in that money trap. So it's not as if I'm suggesting I was above it or I was inspired or I was different. I was as trapped up as the next person. And uh, my departure from banking came about in a situation where, you know, rip roaring bull market. I, I literally, my client NTL, I talk about this in the book, Virgin Media now was the highest paying fee paying client in Europe. And then it went from, you know, kind of being a hundred billion dollar market cap company to nothing. And my fortunes, I mean, in that business, you're only, only, you know, you're worth only what your what your what the revenues you clocked in from your last deal or your clients, you know, it's kind of that that's that's how it goes. And I became a target. So in a sense, I was I was forced out. I mean, I could have stayed in some, you know, kind of really loserish kind of role, but I was forced out. I mean, it was like I decided like I'm walking away from all this. And likewise with SoftBank, I mean, I got into a situation where there was this horrible uh, smear campaign. Um, and as a result of which I was sidelined from the Vision Fund. And uh, um, and I talk about that very openly. And I was in a situation where I must say I did at, at that stage, this is very late in life. And it's somewhat easier for me to say because money really wasn't an object. At that stage, I could have stayed and I could have just like, you know, kind of the, the, the uh, clocked in a few more nice paychecks. But the writing thing was something that I've always wanted to do. I mean, I've always been, you mentioned reading, it's been a passion of mine. I didn't get a chance to read as much as I'd like to through my banking years or my soft bank years, but reading, writing, it's what I love. It's what I want to do. And I broke away and uh, committed myself to a two-year degree, which I could talk about. It was quite an experience. I mean, you know, I was in class with with uh, with kids and I, I can call them kids because they were all uh, about the age of my son and daughter, um, in many cases younger. And you know, being in a classroom for two, two and a half years, it was it was started off being intimidating, but was a really, really intense experience. Um, so uh, so that that's that's kind of my journey, kind of in and out of the money trap, basically. Okay. That's interesting. I remember that part where you speak about uh, the writing class and it, when you when you speak to one of the kids there, was it Ben? Was it Ben? Uh, it, it was indeed. And I've used his real name and he was exactly as I described it. He was a street poet from Vermont. And by that, I mean, uh, Ben Wood and he wore a beret uh, and he was he was, you know, he was he was a communist. I mean, you know, his hero was Leon Trotsky. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, really, really interesting character. And as you can imagine, I mean, you know, for 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 people like that, you know, kind of I'm this great evil, you know, I'm this 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 the ultimate banking, the ultimate capitalist. Right. I mean, that, that, that was my background. So it made for some really, really uh, interesting discussions. And by the way, in case you're wondering what a street poet does, it's exactly what you might think. He would, um, you know, on, 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 the, on the streets of Manhattan, he would just stand by in his beret and and anyone who wants to, you know, just come to him and you say, hey, Ben, write me a poem. And he would write you a poem. And it's a little bit like, you know, musicians busking on streets and he'd write you a poem. Yeah. And if you like what he, you know, like what he says, then you give him a tip. Literally, that's what this guy was doing. Yeah. This is actually really, really cool to be surrounded by people like that. As you can imagine, so far removed from the life I've, I've, uh, I'd, I'd led and the people I've kind of lived with for my career, it was, it was, it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about Baskin, that reminds me about the, that reminds me of that line from that song from that Simon and Garfunkel song. Uh, uh, you know, the where they're talking about Baskin on the streets. Uh, right, right. There was a beautiful. Come to I know which one. Yeah, which one? Um, uh, I'll come to me. I'm a huge Paul Simon it'll, fan, it'll, but I can't. I can't quite place the song. Yeah. It'll, it'll come to me. It'll come to me. It's a beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Song. So By the way, if you're a music if you're a music fan, I'll separately send you there's a Spotify money trap playlist because that's just how my mind works. I will do that actually because it's 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 in in some sense, you know, I thought to myself, um, um, you th think about how important soundtracks are to movies, 
right? Yeah. Uh, now, you know, it's overdone in Bollywood, but let's not go there, right? Yes. <laughs> Frequently the soundtrack overwhelms the movie, but 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 that's not what I'm talking about. And I always, my favorite example is, uh, you seen Chariots of Fire? Yeah. Yeah, wonderful movie, right? I mean, you remember that opening scene where where you've you know you've got that beautiful theme playing and there's these guys running on the beach. Now I always think of that. It's a it's a really evocative scene, but absent the music, it would just be a bunch of skinny white guys in their underwear walking on a pretty desolate beach. Right? The music kind of gives it this ethereal quality, and I think the smell. You know, why 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 should we have a soundtrack or two? Uh, to a book. So um, I actually pulled together a lot of the music references I had in the book and I kind of put it together. Oh, nice, nice. I, I, yeah. I'd really like to have that because that's that's some, yeah. in fact, I should have probably mentioned that there's some great recommendations for music as well. So, right, right. Yeah. That, that, that's something. So if I were if, just to take this, now to take this conversation further, you know, so early mm -hmm. on, you begin um, with uh, the impressions of Dick Cheney when you meet him. And mm -hmm. the business like demeanor he carries, and yeah. only one time when he breaks out into a smile, and then later on, um, you speak about you go on later to speak about your uh, conversations on the edges of uh, another event, uh, where you speak about uh, you know conversations that you have with uh, other political leaders as well, and that includes Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Now. Uh, I got the impression on reading the book that you're using a show not tell approach as we call it in writing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you can you take us uh, can you share some insights into what is it that binded or bound binds all these political leaders that you were interacting with through your through the through the years that you have gotten to see them? Yeah, I um, it, it it's an interesting question. I haven't thought about that as a theme, and I haven't. I don't want to exaggerate how many political leaders I've actually met. I'm just trying to think in the book the ones that um, I mentioned my encounter with Bill Clinton, and yes, uh, yes. Ca candidly, that's the one that made the greatest impact because he had that magnetic charisma. I mean, I heard him speak, and his view of the world, um, and he talked about politics, geopolitics. This was his first public appearance after he, um, um, after, you know, after his second term in office. And his clarity in terms of geopolitical thinking was remarkable, uh, not just his thinking, the way he expressed himself. And then I had a chance to chat with him one-on-one, -on -one, and there was this, this you know, hypnotic quality. This was literally two minutes I talked to him, he made me feel literally as if I was the most important person in the world for him. And uh, that is a quality that that great, great politicians have. So to me, that kind of stands alone. Uh, and I don't want to come across as a Clinton fanboy, right? I mean, some of what he did is, you know, we could, we could go on joking about that. But he had that quality. Um, Dick Cheney was very different. Um, you know, he candidly did not make an impression. And I don't say that in so many words. You're right. I mean, I just I just show, I don't tell, I don't make any judgments. I talk about about the impression that Cheney made with uh, sorry, that Clinton made in the context of 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 the impression Mark Zuckerberg made, which is Zuckerberg had practiced that same talent, not in the same league, but he practiced that same talent. And he obviously been, my sense was he'd probably been tutored. Um Cheney came across as consistent with his public persona. Unsmiling is the word I use to describe him. Um, his view of the world was paranoid, gloomy, it's very well known. Um, mm -hmm. He talked about that and uh, and it was just a very bright, you know, kind of very impression of someone who is cold, unfeeling, analytical, I don't think he was, he never, he was never a politician, right? I mean, you know, he was, um, I don't think he was ever elected for anything. So, it, it, you know, very different kind of individual. Narendra Modi had that same magnetic presence, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the, what I talk about in this to me is, is, you know, I mean, when you, when you talk about show is tell, my highlight of that Modi meeting was nothing that, that he actually said, 
but was that first meeting where I went towards him. And it really made an impression on me. And this gets to an issue that I tease out in the book, which is one of identity for immigrants, right? Because I go up to him. Now, I grew up in Delhi, first 21 years of my life. Um, I, I might have been to Mumbai once. I'd never been anywhere in the south of India, literally. Mumbai was as far as I'd gone. I hadn't been anywhere, to be quite honest. And uh, so, uh, so, so for me, you know, this is this is. Uh, um, I'm in Delhi, and I'm meeting whatever one might think of Modi. And I don't want to get into a political debate. Um, you know, he has his he has his pros and cons. But for me, there's still an element of like, this is my prime minister. So I go up to him, and you know, I very respectfully lower my head and I do a namaste, right? And he ignores that. He wasn't trying to be rude, but he just ignores the namaste and he shoots out his hand and gives me a very firm handshake. And and it made an impression on me because, you know, here's me thinking, you know, I have this impression of myself as a local boy in my hometown. And for him, he sees me dressed in this fancy Italian suit, wearing this French tie and et cetera. And he's presumably been brief. So as far as him concerned, you know, my, 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 you know, uh, my my skin tone might be the same as his, but he's thinking of me as this American English banker, and you know, just sort of the identity in terms of how you see yourself and and how others see you. So that that was kind of my highlight of that meeting. And yeah, I'm rambling a little bit, but you know, I my experiences with with all of these politicians, all of these big shots were were very very different. It's very tough to to make generalizations in the same way that you can't really make generalizations across great writers or great journalists. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, a, sure. it's, 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 it's really, I've been asked, you know, kind of, you met all these billionaires and, you know, kind of, and you, know, you tend to lump, people tend to lump them together. What are the common, th- I, I didn't find that many common threads, actually. It's right. just very different, very unique, which is kind of what makes them interesting to write about and talk about. Right. So, so, so talking about personalities, you know, the picture you paint through the pages of say, and Elon Musk, for example, you know that did yeah. not come across as particularly flattering to me. Though it, yeah. though it don't say that in as many words. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and I thought um, when you spoke about Mark Zuckerberg as well. Uh, yeah. Um, it's uh, it, it 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 I I didn't quite take a liking to him. Basis got this question. <laughs> Uh, and this has, to, you know, he kills animals, you know, the to, uh, to you know, that's what you eat. So you kill what, yeah. what you kill, and he's got this yeah. philosophical thing going about it. Um, yeah. The, and and I got the impression. This is the impression yeah. okay, that Silicon Valley is full of these oversized personalities, and uh, you know, there's oversized money, if I may use the word as well. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, no, like you described, like you just said, you know, you were a 21 year old New Delhi boy who got catapulted to this world and you integrated. So, as you were integrating into this stream, you know, um, what was going on into your mind through the back of your mind as you were integrating into Silicon Valley? You've been fairly vulnerable in the book, but on the one, on the one hand, you know, you, you've been yeah. offended, but then. I'm sure there's more to the narrative than what you put on the pages. No, I don't. I actually don't think there's much more to the narrative. I mean, you know, you, you ask how I integrated uh, into Silicon Valley, Wall Street. I mean, I um, I've been around a lot, and that's probably an understatement, right? Because and I had to integrate in many different ways in many different places initially. Um, uh, you know, to the Wharton School in Philadelphia. By the way, I had a brilliant kind of literal homecoming. I was there yesterday and it was just mind blowing. I mean, I have an auditorium full of people and it was really, really cool talking to them. But, you know, I had to, I, I struggled with that. I was young, completely out of my depth. Uh, Morgan Stanley, I talk about a little bit. I spent 16 years there, but I started off in New York. And at the time, Morgan Stanley was this you know, maybe a handful of Jewish employees, one or two African Americans, maybe one or two Indians. I mean, but you know, it was it was not easy to fit in, and it, it wasn't easy to fit into America generally. Things are so much better now, by the way. So, you know, I had to, I had to at the time it was struggling with with um, with with issues of ethnicity, with race and culture. You know, that was a big challenge from an integration perspective. Um, 
And then I eased into it, but then I didn't stick around in the US, right? I mean, you know, I moved to Asia. In some respects, I was fortunate. I volunteered to move to Asia in 1993. And then I reconnected with India. I set up Morgan Stanley's business in India, which which I volunteered for and was was an incredibly exciting thing to do at a very young age. So no, it was a, it was it was it was a matter of reintegrating, but I was very, you know, because I was very young then, so that was sort of easy to do. Uh, it helped that I surrounded myself with with people who were integrated. I mean, the first people I hired, and I do mention that in my book, was uh, Jyoti Raditya Sindhya, who, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he was the junior most person in my team. He was my analyst, and he was an extraordinarily bright, you know, when he was sent to me, he was introduced to my father through his father, and I met him, and I was thinking, this is one of those, oh my God, you know, Indian style politician son, give him a job kind of meetings. But I met this guy, and he is, he was incredibly respectful, uh, serious, um, really bright, earnest, just, and just turned out to be a terrific hire. And I knew his father too. His father was a really, really classy individual, right? I mean, it's one of those people who were like, you know, this wonderful story I have about him where, you know, he would, he was a keen golfer, but not that you have to put it in an Indian context, which you understand. You in Western Yama, your son? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm talking, I, I'm, I'm talking about the father and the youngster okay. was a chip of the old block, right? I mean, yeah, the father was, he was a keen golfer. Uh, he was, well, he was Maharaja of Gwalior, which is a very big deal, right? I mean, it was a 20, 21 gun salute state, right? Uh, and, uh, and he was a minister, right? But, right. you know, when he would set up a golf game, he would never call, and this one of his golfing partners told me, and it really stuck in my mind, he would never call, get his secretary to call. He would always call himself, which in and of itself is a big deal. He would yeah. always start the conversation by saying that, you know, are you available? Are you free this weekend? As opposed to, I want to, you know what I mean? So it is, and and, and Jyoti Raditya was exactly like that. So I used people like that. I, I surrounded myself with people like that, that helped me reintegrate and, um, and, uh, and, 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 and penetrate. And then I came out, we were probably 20 years ahead of our time in, um, in India. And, uh, you know, I, I, I then uh, kind of joined the TMT bandwagon in the bull market to the late 90s, 2000s. Uh, that was easy. I mean, I was I was very much established at, at Morgan Stanley, very quickly became a managing director. And from there upon, the integration process became a lot easier. Um, Silicon Valley, my good friend Nikesh Arora helped me a lot, right? I mean, he was the, as the number two guy at Google, he was, still is, the consummate insider in the Valley, right? right. So... Uh, uh, being being Indian in the Valley is not a challenge. It's dominated by Indians. So it's actually <laughs> completely the opposite, right? I mean, you know, it is, uh, it, 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 it's almost unusual to find, you know, kind of plain old wasp white male CEOs. I mean, you know, Indians rule the roast. Uh, if it's not Indian immigrants, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's Taiwanese transplants like Jensen Wang, right? So the Valley is wonderful that way, right? I mean, that diversity is fantastic. So that integration into that community, thanks mainly to Nikesh, was was incredibly straightforward. Uh, Japan is challenging and it's a very insular place, but I gotta tell you, I mean, uh, again, you start off with a huge advantage being under Masa-san's wing, but the people I met at SoftBank and I described them and hopefully that comes across, they were just wonderfully endearing. And, you know, when I reflect on things I miss about SoftBank, I don't miss the paychecks. I miss hanging out with Masa Saw. He was fun. And I miss all the people he surrounded himself with. I mean, they were they were just, I was just genuinely fond of them. So that integration was at least, you know, for me, quite straightforward as well. Right, right, right. right. It's 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 interesting you put it this way, but you know, but that you still haven't answered my question on Elon Musk. Where does he sit in your book? Oh, Elon Musk. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, okay. No, look, I'll come back and answer that very directly. Um, yeah. And, and I, I think the way you describe both of them, Zuckerberg and Elon Musk, in terms of how I characterize them, is spot on. Um, now, Elon Musk specifically, I was five years ago, 10 years ago, I was a huge Elon Musk fan because he had that rare quality of being a visionary, um, in some ways an idealist in terms of using technology to make the world a better place. Let me put it in simple terms. Uh, If you accept that climate change is a challenge, Elon Musk 
has done more to address that problem than anyone on the planet categorically, way more than Al Gore, Obama, and Biden combined. You know, Al Gore got a Nobel Prize for basically making a nice documentary. Not to discredit, but you know what I mean, right? I mean, you know, it's 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 he did and 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 creating Tesla, the electric car company, is a very big deal. It's from an engineering perspective, from a technology perspective. It's not as simple as you take a car and you plunk an electric battery in it. Okay, you had to completely re-engineer not just the car, but the industry. You had to eliminate distributors. You know, Tesla has no dealerships, right? So completely eliminate the intermediary because that dramatically reduces your cost structure, a lot of friction there. Um, you start with a computer, right? And then you surround it with a car's body as opposed to the other way around, right? And the car manufacturers all over the world are still catching up to that, right? You know, what he did with rockets, fantastic. I mean, I don't know if you saw this video. If you haven't, you should. This, this SpaceX reusable rocket, it's mind blowing. A rocket that's been in space that comes back to its launch pad and lands gently as if it's being guided in by two giant metallic chopsticks. That is really, really cool. And it saves NASA tens of billions of dollars. Now, what don't I like about Elon Musk? You know, for a man who's accomplished so much, mm-hmm. come on, man. I mean, some of the things you're saying and some of the things you're doing now, and you've kind of just locked yourself into this buffoonery around politics. I mean, stay in your swim lane. I mean, you are just so awesome. You're a force of nature when it comes to technology. Keep doing what you do best, you know? Salty, you talked about the boring company, which is, you know, kind of digging tunnels and hyperloop tunnels. So you have high-speed transit underground. Do mm-hmm. that in Silicon Valley. I mean, you know, this, this is like, you know, smartest people in the world. I talk about this. Smartest people in the world. And I'm stuck here in traffic on the US 101, solve problems like that, right? I mean, create another degree of motion as opposed to messing around with you know, kind of Twitter or X or whatever he want to call it. So that's my view on, uh, on, on, on Elon Musk and that probably comes across in the book. Uh, with Zuckerberg, I have a fairly cynical view of social networks. Though I have to say, double standards, I've been very cynical about social networks but it's certainly been helpful in terms of promoting my book. That literally is the first time I've actually <laughs> actually found a use for social networks. So I'd be hypocritical of me if I did not acknowledge that. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I hear you on that. But in- incidentally, <clears throat> there's another comment you make in the book as well, that you, know, um, you grew up leaning ideologically to the left, but as you started, you know, but once you got into the business, um, you could feel yourself tilt to the right uh, from a very business perspective, yeah, it, it was a comment that I came across. And uh... no, and I, I don't, I don't think I ever said that I was leaning to the left. The only comment I make on my politics is, and that hasn't changed since I was a teenager, is is I'm a libertarian. You know, I don't Liberty. believe yeah, in yeah. in yeah. So I, I which which is as far right as it goes when it comes to economic issues, yeah. right? I am totally left-leaning. In America, it gets very confusing because left and right is collated with social issues like, you know, gay people, gay marriage, uh, uh, you know, this fascination with religion and Christianity, this bizarre American fascination with guns. Those things are part of the American right. I don't relate to any of that at all. So, right. So for socially, I'm very left-wing. But economically, and this comes from growing up in India in the 70s and 80s, you know, kind of in the license Raj, you know, yeah. Indra Gandhi inspired, that that would turn anyone right wing, you know, because you just, there's a giant experiment going on in terms of how not to run an economy and it failed miserably, right? So yeah. that's kind of where my political views were formed. Uh, in fact, not to make too fine a point of it, um, I use... I probably I'm a little bit guilty of, um, and I'll acknowledge it, of literary and musical references in my book, but there's a ton of other literary references that I don't expect anyone to get. And I'll give you an example. The first line in chapter one is Dr. Shiv Gupta laughed. Now, a handful of people have made that connection because that is a reference to the first line in Ayn Rand's Fountainhead. First line of that book is Howard Rope laughed, right? And it is a 
I didn't want to go off and spend two pages talking about about objectivism versus Marxism or Ayn Rand and the politics, which have been which are outmoded, and not fashionable, etc. I was just making the point, and you will appreciate this: that back then in India, Ayn Rand had a cult following, right, and yes, it made an impression yes. on people, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's some very subtle references in there. So I, you know, I got that's 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 kind of hopefully that answers your question on my does, politics and how I got to where I am. Today. Yes, it does. It certainly does. Yeah. I, I I remember that line from Ayn Rand. Yeah. Yeah, Suddenly. exactly. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Certainly do. Certainly do. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so, you know, since, since I was asking about um, Silicon uh, Valley, there's another thing that, you know, that got my attention. It was very interesting. The You, you make this point about Silicon Valley thesis, about a Silicon Valley thesis that happens once every decade about the India story, about our yeah. bank. Yeah. yeah. On the yeah. yeah, every yeah. decade yeah. and it uh, fritters yeah. away. <laughs> yeah. I found that you know the same thing. You know the the demographics, uh, the young demographics, and I think we've heard middle that. class demographics, democracy, speak English. Yeah. 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 So so yeah. so yeah. What does where does India stand right now as we speak from New York and Silicon Valley? And and can yeah. you be a little unemotional about this one, please? Yeah, no, yes, yeah, so, hey, you know, so the, the, uh, yeah, the worst words to use, kind of bordering on cliche once again in, uh, in when it comes to Wall Street is saying this time is different, right? But I will, I will go out on a limb and say that this time might be different. Uh, the, 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 the point I made, by the way, um, on a more serious note with respect to the Western world falling in love with India, Indian financial markets anyway, for the same set of reasons. That is an observed phenomena. And a lot of people who've read the book have commented on how accurate that is, right? So I stand by that comment. Um, now, in the cycle of things right now, we're at probably close to peak hype when it comes to India. The only point I would make in defense of the this time it's different argument is that I think relative to say, the last bull market, the Indian market this time is driven much more by domestic capital, as has been the case in prior bull runs, which is healthy, right? Because I, in prior bull runs in the in the nineties, for example, when I set up India's um, uh, sorry Morgan Stanley's investment banking business in India, uh, India was an emerging market in the sense of illiquidity and the dominance on FII flows, foreign investor flows as a big explainer of the markets going up and down. And I think I think those stats in terms of FII flows are still important, but less than they used to be. Right. So um, I, I would just throw that out there. But I do think as a as a as an observed kind of sociological phenomena across the Western worlds, you know, people, India is incredibly seductive and people sometimes lose track of the fact that in terms of spending power, the numbers are incredibly small, that the Indian price consumer is arguably the most price sensitive consumer in the world. And that India, unlike, you know, state mandated, we shall grow in China, for example, we shall grow at 10%. And then whether you like it or not, you grow at 10%. There's so many push-pull factors in the Indian democracy. Uh, you know, it's fractured in terms of number of states. It's very tough to generalize. And you understand these things much better than I do. But not that many Western analysts have the sophistication to appreciate the complexity of India, I guess, is a point I would stand by. Okay. 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 Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So now that you now that you brought up China and this uh, as well into this conversation, um, and, and this this is something of which uh, is of great interest uh, on all sides of the, in all parts of the world, India included. Yeah. Yeah. You've spoken about China as well in your book. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so from a geopolitical perspective, uh, yeah, we're hotting up right now, and yeah. um, there's. America's big tech versus China's big tech, and you made yeah. you made, you've also laid out the differences between both. Uh, sure, sure, sure. So that's that's pretty obvious to most people who follow yeah. the business. Uh, yeah. But um, 
um, let's keep that out of the way. But from where you are, mm -hmm. from your perch and yeah. Silicon Valley, yeah. Uh, yeah. what is the China opportunity looking like right now? Yeah. So look, I mean, I and, and, and you know, I'm not going to play Henry Kissinger and start talking about you know kind of geopolitics in China. But the here's what I will tell you from my ob observations about China. Um, and I have dealt with China a lot in both my incarnations, right? And um, I my first major dealings were early '90s um, when I when I set up our capital markets business, Morgan Stanley's capital markets business. We couldn't raise money for China. Right? Mm -hmm. We did a bond issue for the Bank of China. That was a very big deal. But then another very interesting experience, more on point with what you're talking about in the world of technology, and this I think is really really important to understand when it comes to investing in China. So I. Um, well, I say I, a team of us at Morgan Stanley were charged with taking China Unicom public. China Unicom is at the time, um, and this is in uh, this is in the 90s, mid 90s. At the time, Chinese telecommunications, Chinese mobile was a monopoly. You just had China Mobile, right? The Ministry of Communications decided they needed a second carrier, and they gave us the mandate to create this carrier and take it public. So basically, we went to them, okay, you want to do this, you've got to give, you know, back then people made money on long distance calls. Uh, so we said, okay, give them, allow them an opportunity to make money, give them a license to do international long distance calls, um, give them spectrum, which is valuable, uh, CDMA spectrum, which was cutting edge spectrum, a lot of spectrum, so they have capacity. Um, give them a management team, all of which they agreed to, give them spectrum, give them the licenses, management team, plucked out people from China Mobile and stuck it into China Unicom. And my key learning from that is, look, if it's just so easy to create this company, it is equally easy to unravel it, right? And when I come here, I came to SoftBank, I started looking at Alibaba. Now, what people may not appreciate about um, Alibaba and Tencent, some of these Chinese companies that are traded in America, what investors invest in is not actually equity in the company. They invest in an offshore, typically in a location like the Cayman Islands entity called a variable interest entity, which gives you the right to the profits the company makes in China, right? So it's a proxy for investing in equity, um, you know, the share of profits, et cetera, has never really been completely tested in courts. And one might take a fairly cynical view of courts in China anyway. And that to me kind of adds another layer of risk, right? So you put all that together, you know, the whimsical nature of, of capitalism in China, you know, one minute it's glorious to be rich, and now all of a sudden, you really don't want to be on the list of the top 10 richest people in China because that just makes you a target, right? So, you know, there's that overlay. And I was always aware of that from my dealings in China in and out from the early 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I've just always been sensitive to that. So I think when it comes to, it's a roundabout way of answering your question, when it comes to investing in China, there's no denying the scale of the opportunity, just as is the case with India. You know, it is it's actually a more developed market. There's no denying that there is a fantastic pool of engineers trained in physics and AI and computer science, probably even more so than India. So great pool of talent too. So a lot of the building blocks are there, but there is this risk, this overlay of risk that bothers me. You know, from a soft bank perspective, you look at what's happened where the invested in, look at soft banks investing in China, you know, Alibaba, for example, yeah. you know, after, you know, how what happened with Alipay, with Alibaba, you know, that was terrible from a soft bank perspective because so much of the, the value was tied up in Alibaba. Um, uh, Didi, right? I mean, Didi, yeah. the, which is the equivalent of Oyo, Didi suffered a huge hit, went public at, uh, I think the number was a double digit number and then traded as low as two or $3, right? Uh, yeah. um, ByteDance, which is the parent company for TikTok, which is a brilliant Masasan investment. Masa correctly identified how the TikTok AI algorithms would prove to be better than any of the algorithms that Facebook and others meta uh, come up with with Instagram or, or, um, or uh, Snapchat. And uh, and you spot on that turned out to be a phenomenal success story. But now you've got this political overlay, which is, you know, it's now it's banned in India and it's, it's position in uh, TikTok's position in the US is... Uh, 
is tremulous to say the least. There's a lot of uncertainty. So that just adds, just going through specific investments, real examples, just, just adds an overlay of risk to investing in China. India, by the way, has been a collateral beneficiary of that. Yeah, India has been a beneficiary of that. Yeah. True. Yeah. True. So yeah. why not that? I mean, since you since you spoke about uh, uh, you know your um, your reservations about China, I remember that line from the book about why uh, Myerson wanted to you know he was so uh, Alibaba was so special to him and yeah yeah how do you, how do you resolve that dichotomy between the both of you? And when Nikesh was there as well, you know, that he said that he would never sell Alibaba. He well, would... um, so we, well, it, it's actually a great question. I mean, I, um, we, uh, Masa had a, and I talk about this at lunch, I you know, kind of raised the possibility of, you know, was he thinking about selling Alibaba when the company went public? See, venture capitalists, when you invest, and you know exactly what I'm talking about because you follow technology. Once right. a company goes public, if you're a venture capitalist, particularly if you've been here in there for, you know, period in this, in Masa's case, for well over 15 years, you probably think in terms of taking some chips off the table, right? Um, right. Um, you know, you invested 40 million, the company was worth very little and it's gone public and it's worth 50 billion. I mean, that's mind blowing, right? I mean, so right. that's the context in which I raised it with Masa. And he pushed back on that. And he was right because the company's value went up as much as it went up to as much as, you know, well over 200 billion, as I recall, right? So he was right to hold on. And, you know, it's like, you know, for example, selling Google at its IPO would have been a mistake. It's been a phenomenal performer. But but there is the overlay of diversification, which is an important concept. Uh, it's never going to go out of fashion when it comes to risk management, when it comes to investing. And I think the argument that prevailed on Masa, uh, that Nikesh and I, um, you know, led by Nikesh, uh, you know, kind of prevailed on him that, look, let's lighten up, particularly if you're thinking in terms of big acquisitions like Harm. And given that SoftBank had already acquired Sprint, uh, was unable to merge Sprint with T-Mobile, so you had this struggling phone company which, which, which was on balance sheet in terms of its, you know, over $30 billion of debt for SoftBank, that's a lot of burden to carry in terms of leverage. And if you actually want to stay on the acquisition trail, if you want to look at companies like Arm, you really do need some liquidity. So that's the argument that prevailed uh, in terms of lightening up on Alibaba. We sold 10 billion and we also sold close to 10 billion um, stake. I think it's more like 8 billion in um, in Supercell, which is not as well known as Alibaba, was a, but was a fantastic soft bank investment gaming company, mobile gaming company in Finland. Right. Right. I'm going to come to Arm in a moment. Okay. Yeah, sure. But uh, before that, um, since, you, since we're talking about soft bank, uh, just let me stay on that for a moment, on SoftBank for mm -hmm. a moment. You were looking mm -hmm. at the odds of SoftBank and, you know, you you build on, uh, on your time there at length. Uh, yeah. You know, there's this part where you speak about, you know, it's, you know, there was a point when uh, investments of 1 billion was thought to be cool, but SoftBank, yeah. 100 billion cool. Yeah, yeah. And um, so... What SoftBank's legacy? I mean, what did it do? Did it did did, did SoftBank fundamentally alter the character of um, Silicon Valley? Would that be Myosin's legacy? Now that you look back with the benefit of hindsight, did did Silicon Valley get spoiled with the numbers of unicorns that came up? And I and I can see that uh, there's you know this you 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 you've also quoted Bill Gurley later on, uh, yeah. who goes on to say that uh, you know. Uh, investors spoiled Silicon Valley. Um, how would you? How would you? What what kind of a perspective would you yeah. share on? Yeah, that? I think. Well, first of all, on Masa Sun's legacy, uh, I think he has a he has a lot of runway left. The man yeah. is going strong. So, uh, I think his big legacy so far has been getting big bets in a kind of this this crazy guy who lives in the future kind of idea. Right. He's proven that out and he's gotten these big bets spectacularly right. And I mean spectacularly, right? I mean, right. Arm, which we can talk about, you know, mark the market gain of well over $100 billion, Vodafone Japan, 
$40 billion. These are phenomenal numbers by any standards. Alibaba fully realized, you know, cash in the bank, uh, over $70 billion. I think the number was, if I'm not mistaken, $73 billion. Someone did the math in the Wall Street Journal. So that's, to me, that's his legacy. Seeing around corners, living in the future, identifying technology trends early and getting them spectacularly right in a, in a monetary sense. Now, Coming back to more granular, answering your question about impact on Valley, yeah, I think Massa really did, or the SoftBank Vision Fund, kind of up the ante for most people. I mean, in my book, I describe this meeting with, uh, because I think these messages are always well delivered by telling stories. I talk about how we met with, uh, yeah, with, with Sequoia, and Sequoia is Silicon oh, Valley, yeah. uh, rules, rules the roost, I mean, you know, Apple, Google, you name it, they're behind everything. And Doug Leone, who's the managing partner, came to see Massa, I joined Massa for the meeting. And the guy left with kind of a puzzled look on his face, right? I mean, never seen anything like it, right? I mean, you know, it, it, it literally, I mean, I was a huge cricket fan and one of my formative cricket experiences was the first test match I went to was Vivian Richards making his test debut at Ferocia Kotla and he scored 192 not out, right? I've never seen anything like it, right? I mean, you know, this idea of someone playing, it's a game that you think you know, but you see someone that's kind of like, okay, I mean, you know, this is this is the this is just amazing to watch, right? And and I get the sense that Doug Leone almost left with that kind of reaction. He says, I don't understand this guy. This is like, this is like he's, he's, he's on a different planet. But, you know, he might have said that, but what did he do when he went out? I mean, you know, he came around and he started to lecture Massa a little bit on what are you doing, but what did he do next? You know, it's nobody in the Valley had billion dollar funds. That was very unusual. Sequoia's fund was $2 billion, but very quickly they went and raised an $8 billion fund, right? So, now you people routinely talk about billion dollar funds, not just billion dollar funds. People talk about billion dollar individual investments in companies, you know, artificial super intelligence without a penny in revenue, $5 billion valuation, $1 billion invested, right? So these yeah. numbers, it is, I actually would argue that a little bit of this is from, and I don't mean this in a positive or negative sense because a lot of what's going on with technology is terrific. But a lot of it is the impact of SoftBank. It just raised the stakes in terms of people raising more money and more money being thrown at technology. Right. Okay. Okay. So now I want to come to ARM with you. You know, the mm -hmm. ARM position. Now, I don't want to get into the intricacies of that because you yeah. have come to much detail on in that. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. You know, giving that out would be unfair to you and to the book. Uh, I think right. that's right. Something to be read out but uh um, yeah but you know the, the whole thing around semiconductors uh yes a fascinating story you know i, I look at semiconductors as the new oil you know, uh really yeah 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 yeah, yeah. 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 that's a good comparison yeah yeah so, so so you know if you were to do some a bit of crystal ball gazing on how may this game pan out you've spoken about arm you've spoken about nvidia at great length um and you know all of the. I, I think people should spend some time on your book trying to understand what is you know how what has happened behind the scenes. But on how may this yeah. whole play out? Uh, really, that's one part. Uh, yeah. The question. I'll come to the second part after you've done your question. Okay. Work. Yeah. I mean, you know, part of the challenge when it comes to writing about technology is you can almost take for granted that whatever you've written will be out of date very quickly. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, so I, without, I mean, I don't mean to, it sounds like I'm undermining my own book, which I really shouldn't do, but but I want to be honest with you in the spirit of this conversation. So, you know, the a lot has happened since then. I don't think anything that's happened changes anything I wrote in the book, uh, but but I just throw that out as a, as a caveat. But okay. here's what I will say about technology and, and, and the Masa Sun and the SoftBank aspect is really important to understand. So... Um, if there is such a thing as a first love for Masa San, it is semiconductors, right? Okay. I mean, he he tells the story which I described in my book uh, is he saw a picture in a magazine and he had tears of joy in his eyes, right? And yes. for people in my generation, it would have been like, you know, maybe watching a cover of Playboy or Penthouse magazine. That sounds terribly <laughs> sexist. I have to apologize for that. But no, you know what right. I'm talking about. Yeah, for no, people of exactly. that generation, right? You know, it's like, it's like, you know, picture of a magazine that like, you know, there's a 
which you saw as a teenager. That's the association I have anyway, good or bad. But yeah. for Masason, it was it was an Intel, you know, 880 processor microchip. And he's like, that's always fascinated him. And that's why ARM was a company he'd followed, he coveted, I think it's fair to say. So it's a company he wanted to own. And uh, and that's how the ARM acquisition came about. Now, ARM is a very interesting company. It doesn't actually it's not a foundry, so it doesn't manufacture chips. It's a pure IP company. Its business is, is licensing fees, upfront licensing fees and royalty payments like you know, companies like Qualcomm or Apple or TSMC, or many other companies make to it by licensing its technology. And part of ARM's secret source has been energy efficiency. And just, just bookmark that comment because energy efficiency is absolutely crucial to what's happening with it, with AI, right? And because of its designs being energy efficient, they were they became the dominant chip design used in smartphones. Because you know that if you, if you think about you know kind of one of the things that irks people the most about smartphones is is how quickly the battery runs out and they keep on kind of the technology with respect to battery keeps on getting better but we keep on using them more and more so it's a constant race right uh, um, so uh, it is uh, that was always arms um, secret sauce now what masa has done with or is doing with arm um, with Rene Haas the new CEO and I know Rene he's, he's, he's just he ran the the, the chip part uh, and rather than the services part. So the core part of ARM's business is a terrific CEO and a technologist. What they're trying to do is AI is increasingly going to move to the edge of the network. By the edge of the network, I mean smartphones and I mean autonomous cars, right? And these devices will, will have hundreds of cars, will have thousands of chips, chips with embedded intelligence um, in terms of AI, what they're doing at the edge, um, Apple intelligence with the new generation of Apple smartphones, the Apple 16s, Apple intelligence, which is what they call their AI platform will be rolled out and you and I will engage with AI in a much more meaningful way, which hasn't happened so far. And this idea of energy efficiency in a car, in a phone, that kind of gives, gives ARM a real advantage. So. AI chips deployed at the edge of the network is a lot of the excitement about ARM. Um, that's the reason the stock price, part of the reason the stock price has traded the way it has. ARM um, also has the potential to, over time, to compete with NVIDIA in data centers, which is where NVIDIA is completely dominant, right? So um, SoftBank bought a company called GraphCore in the UK, which has, uh, which has a, you know, NVIDIA has their general purpose graphic processing units that come up with a new generation every year. Using GraphCo, it is conceivable and it's gonna require a, a, a lot of, you know, tech combination of a great technologist, which Masa and Vinay are, and a lot of capital and a lot of patience to come up with an NVIDIA challenges, but they certainly have the potential to build that off. So that's a little bit of what's unfolding in the, in the, uh, in the chip space, the way I see it. Okay. There are others who are trying to build NVIDIA competitors. There's a company called uh, Cerebrus, which is going public, which has this, you know, kind of, which makes chips the size of a of a of a, of a, of a uh, pizza pie, I guess I should say, uttapam in an Indian context. But you know, literally, that's what they're doing, right? I mean, so uh, uh, they they will have a uh, they will have an interesting uh, you know, jury's out as to whether or not they can actually develop into a meaningful challenge. I think I think right now, NVIDIA rules the roost. Nvidia rules the rules. So, so that's yeah. that's that's the uh, uh, since you spoke of that, and that's that's where the second part of my question is coming up. You know, there's this yeah. whole yeah. make in India narrative that has come up out here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there is a push for Indian fabs as well. And now, when yeah. I look at the chips that are coming out of there, you know, they're at least about fifteen to twenty nanometers. And you know, we, uh, I don't know if they have a future at all, or should be, you know. Is it the beginnings? Is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Um, should India be looking at it this way? Uh, or is there another alternative way to look at it, the way ARM is going about it? What would what would you what would you have to say on that one? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the barriers to entry for a business like ARM, there's a basic technology barrier to entry that ARM has, right? A, a, a moat, if you will. Um, uh, and and that's just very, and by that I mean just the IP that they've developed, which came out of Cambridge University, came out of, you know, came, uh, came many years ago, and they've just had this amazing pool of engineers that they recruit all over the world, and they, that technology keeps on improving. That is very, very tough to replicate, but to answer your question directly, is this the right thing for India to do? Kennedy is the right thing, not only for India, it's the right thing for the world, because you don't want to be so completely reliant on TSMC, which is the case today. Everyone outsources to TSMC, and that's a little bit scary because we can all agree um, that you know one of the spark points when it comes to geopolitical volatility is the is the China Taiwan PRC Taiwan axis right so you really do want to reduce your dependence on that um, if this is you know, strip technology is so mission critical just as the US is doing in terms of onshoring to the degree they can uh, um, under Biden, you had an act that effectively gave people, chip manufacturers, tangible financial incentives to manufacture chips in India. I think that's, sorry, in, in the U.S. I think I think that all makes a ton of sense. Um, so I would, uh, you know, the bottlenecks are the obvious ones. Infrastructure is key, right? Uh, infrastructure, labor laws. A lot of this is on a state-by-state -state basis. This is where the complexity of India comes in. But I think um, at a at a big picture level, uh, I think that's that's totally on target. And by the way, you're going to exhaust my knowledge. You probably already have in terms of what's happening at a granular level, state by state. But at a macro level, I'm completely on board with uh, with 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 India uh, at the national and the state level, kind of getting behind this. It's sure. just good for the world. It's good for India. Sure, sure, sure. Um... So, Alok, I know that, you know, we've been going for a while, going on for a while, and I know that you have commitments. So I'm not, and, and I have a truckload of questions, okay? So I'm going to, okay. I'm just going to run through some of them and I'll let you go. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, you know, there's this spot where you, at SoftBank, when you were at SoftBank, where you noticed this propensity of big debt, the big tech to avoid debt and... Yes. Um, Avoiding leverage. Now, uh, yeah. this kind of rather sounded interesting to me, you know, that, you know, yeah. hey, yeah. on one hand, here are the tech bros, as you call them, and, you know, um, who don't mind pushing the boundaries of tech. But when it comes to the finances, they sound very very conservative yeah 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 so, look i mean i think i th i think at the at the root of it is this fundamental insecurity rightly so that most technologists have i mean it goes back to that very famous andy grove comment andy grove being the the uh, uh, former ceo founder ceo if i'm not mistaken yeah. of, of intel uh, yes. you know only the paranoid survive right really so if you live in a state of paranoia and you should be paranoid right because even if you know, Google arguably has the ultimate cash cow, quite possibly in the history of mankind in terms of how phenomenal their, their uh, search business is as a cash generator, how dominant it's become, um, they need to be fairly paranoid at this point in time because something like perplexity comes along and people who use perplexity say, I ain't going back to Google. So you know, AI is a real technology challenge to Google. So even for a company like Google, uh, it is, you always have to be looking over your shoulder and that takes a degree of paranoia. Now, I, for what it's worth as a finance dude, as a corporate finance guy, I think it's a little bit overdone. And I think that from a shareholder value creation, they ought to think in terms of giving back more capital to shareholders. But but to answer your question, that is a lot of uh, where that financial conservatism comes from. They're just uncomfortable with leverage in financial engineering. It's just not that thing. Okay, sure. Um, straightforward question. Are we living in a time of inflated tech valuations? I ask you this because, you know, uh, there is this, the, the, the narrative around the WeWork valuation, for instance, that com comes about in your book and it's been discussed in much detail. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. WeWork is a bit of a one-off because I, and the reason it's a one-off and it doesn't really belong uh, in, in, in my, and it won't come up in an answer to my answer to your question because I never thought of WeWork as a technology company. It's not a technology so, company. You're right. Absolutely so, so, right. So, so, let's keep so, that aside. Yeah. Yeah, let's keep that aside, right? So the disconnect with WeWork was it, was, it should never have been valued as a technology company. So to answer your question very directly, um, in the public markets, yes. In the in the uh, 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 sorry, in the public markets, no. In the private markets, yes. And I'm talking about inflated valuations, and I'll tell you why. Uh, okay. The when you look at public markets, um, Nvidia is the poster child. That's the one you point to as like, oh my god, just look at how it's performed. It's unbelievable. But if you look at Nvidia and you look at its valuation. You know, for a company that has 75% margins that's growing as fast as it has, is a forward PE multiple of 35 to 40 times, is that kind of unreasonable? I don't think so. I mean, I think that there is a real possibility. By the way, I wouldn't go and rush in and buy NVIDIA stock right now. I don't own any, just for the record. Uh, yeah. the, 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 I, I think at some point in the next few quarters, you will see a major earnings hiccup as the hyperscalers you know, Google, Microsoft Cloud, if they step back and they say, okay, you know, we've been ordering in anticipation of demand and we're going to throttle back a little bit. And and then all of a sudden there's going to be a big correction, but NVIDIA's market position is as solid as it's ever been right now. There's no immediate, like earlier comments, notwithstanding, there's no real challenger on site today. And its valuation is not outrageous and it's all relative. You look at NVIDIA's competitive position its role in that AI ecosystem is very similar to what Cisco had in the year 2000 when the when when I made all the hype about the internet. Cisco, but Cisco was trading at 200 times earnings. Uh, so I don't I don't see those valuations. Google, Microsoft, likewise, maybe they're overspending on AI, um, but. You know, can they afford to lose $10, $15 billion? Well, of course they can. They're completely aware of the risk associated with overspending. And it's easy for them to throttle it down. And they've clearly acknowledged. And I think it's sound thinking and I support it. You know, when Sundar Pichai came out and said that the risks of underinvesting outweigh the risks of overinvesting. So I don't have an issue with anything that's going on in the public markets. I think with respect to private markets, you are seeing, talked about safe, this company called Safe Super Intelligence, you know, barely a business model, no revenues, $5 billion valuation, $1 billion going in. That kind of raises a few eyebrows and uh, that's beginning to happen. So I think that valuations in that space may be, may be inflated because there you're talking about, you know, forget about, you don't necessarily need to have profits and, and, and or, or even revenues, but, it's just not even obvious what the business model is with some of these companies. Right. Gotcha. And finally, Alok, one question, one more question. Mm -hmm. before we wind up. You know, one of uh, the best editors I've worked with, Tony Joseph, um, he always used to tell us that a hallmark of a good story um, was at the end of it, you cannot make out if the protagonist of the narrative was a good one or a bad one. Right. And, uh, in the case of uh, your book, one of the protagonists, you know, happens to be Maya, Maya Shisan. And, uh, you know, there are a whole lot of notes. As you can see, you know, it's all completely. Great. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, all my, I, I, I just scribbled through the book. You know, I argue with yeah. the yeah. Um, I I I can't make out if Marshi was batshit crazy, or was he really ahead of his times? Was he a good guy, bad guy? Uh, I I miss my finger. Yeah. On Once again, there's a lot to unpack in that question, and I'll I'll, I'll give you a macro answer first, uh, which is a view of writing which you may or may not agree with. So, I completely disagree with your with 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 your editor. Uh, I, I don't think that it's right for a writer as a novelist, if you're writing a story, fiction, for example, to think of people as good guys or bad guys. I don't know if I'm a good guy or a bad guy. The only thing I can tell you with certainty is I'm a very complex guy, right? So right. to me, when you're dealing with reality, the 
the art of writing is to bring out the richness and the complexity of people without categorizing them as good or bad. Uh, you you show people and then, you know, kind of, there will be readers who will judge them to be good. There will be readers who will judge them to be bad. Uh, you know, there will be people who have, you know, left leaning. You start off with an inherent bias that anyone who's rich, anyone who's a billionaire is inherently evil and you never get them off that. Do you know what I mean? So it is, uh, I don't want to get into good or bad, but here's the question I will answer for you directly because it is backed up by data, right? So Masa Son's ability as a technology, as a technologist to peek into the future is unmatched, right? And he did it with smartphones. He did it with e-commerce in China. He did it with AI. And, you know, with AI, for example, and with AI, I'm talking about ARM, which I do see as a company that's being completely repositioned to be an AI company. You know, the hype about AI, chat GPT, this stuff is only a year old. Masasan was talking about this in 2014. So I think that characterization of Masa as a crazy guy who lives in the future is the right one. That I can say with a degree of confidence. I don't want to get into good guy, bad guy. For me, he was a good guy. I loved him like an older brother, but that's neither here nor there. I, I think the uh, as, 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 a, as, a, as a writer, I want to lay out the complexity of the man, some of the things he said, some of the things he did. A lot of people will say, well, look, he wasn't really fair to you. Well, that's neither here nor there. There's no rancor in me, right? I mean, I kind of, I, I literally, I still look up to him as an older brother and uh, I stay in touch with him and we swap jokes once in a while and and I wish him nothing but 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 uh, but good and I hope he does the same for me. But it is, to coming back to your quick question, yeah, you know, this crazy guy who lives in the future, man, he's got it right too many times. I mean, the facts back it up. I'm sorry, I can't let you go without asking you this one more question. One yeah, more. cool, go for it. Okay, uh, you spoke about thinking about him as a as an older brother. Uh, that's something you spoke about, uh, Nikesh as well, Nikesh Arora. Yeah, and yeah. Then you had to choose. He's, the... he's young. He's younger. He's younger than me, by the way. Yeah. So younger brother in this case. <laughs> sorry, sorry, but he was a brother. <laughs> Thought of him yeah. as a brother. He's a brother. He still is. Yeah. 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 But then there was this point where you had to choose between Nikesh and um uh, Mayoshi, am I right? Uh, no, 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 no. I think I think that's an unfair characterization. I think I think there's a lot of there's a complexity of emotions, but it wasn't a choice between him and Nikesh. It was like, you know, it was I was there in a job and Nikesh was leaving. Right. And the decision is should I stay or should I go? So it's not as if Nikesh at any stage said, Come with me. I'm not sure where he was going. I mean, he was leaving, he was on his own journey to be CEO of something, right? So, uh, uh, and at that point, I had my own relationship with Masa Son. I had my own responsibility to people that I'd recruited, I had mentoring relationship with. And I had a very candid conversation with Masa and I loved what he said. And he was, uh, he was vulnerable. He was very genuine, very affectionate in terms of wanting me to stay. And there's a lot I admired about the man, about his vision. And it was literally as simple as that. I mean, I don't think it was a choice of like, you know, there wasn't like a conflict or a clash between the two and I was stuck in the middle. It was simply a matter of of one fine gentleman uh, wanting because to leave because he had his own objectives in terms of what he wanted to do with his life. And uh, the other gentleman wanting me to stay. And, and I made the decision that it made sense for me to stay. Okay. Never got in the way of my friendship with, with Nikesh, by the way, to be clear. I mean, he encouraged me to stay. He knew it was the right thing for me to do. And we've remained as, we're still to this day, uh, we've been, we've, we're, we're as close as we've ever been. And he's setting up Palo Alto Networks now. Why? It's more than setting up Palo Alto Network, man. I mean, that's been a phenomenal success story. I mean, he's taken that company from a 20 billion market cap to like a 120 billion market cap, which is quite remarkable what he's pulled off that. Yeah. Waiting to hear more about him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Alok, it's been lovely talking to you. Likewise, enjoy the conversation.